Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Monsieur Dame, uh, merci beaucoup uh, pour cette introduction. Thanks a lot for this introduction. Let me make a few comments in French uh, before I do my presentation in English. Uh, after all, we're in Quebec where people speak French, uh, it seems. Donc, uh, quelques mots en français. Uh, a few words in uh, French. For me, it is a great pleasure to uh, be here again. The first time was 35 years ago. I traveled throughout the country, landed in Quebec City, and I right away loved this place, the Quebecers. Not so much in the winter, though, uh, in Qu Quebec City, to be uh, honest, but uh, rather the Quebecers. I did not speak French at all. So I started learning French here 35 years ago with, uh, you know, with a little uh, uh, book and and I went to a uh, self-managed uh, youth hostel with uh, quite a uh, nice team with the, somebody who then eventually went on to be a, a clown and uh, f founded the Rhino Party. Some of you may know him. And also Agnes Malte. Some of you might know her. She's part of a uh, theater a group. So it was a kind of a crazy time. So it's, once again, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here. We'll now uh, talk uh, about nuclear issues, which is a lot less, um, well, how shall I say, um, light than uh, theater or uh, self-managed uh, youth hostels. Uh, what we try to do with the World Nuclear Industry Status Report is which is an annual publication now, is to, to give a broad overview of uh, the, the industry in the world, um, to, to provide sort of a carpet for discussion. The nuclear issue is an issue which a lot of people discuss uh, without knowing much about it. And <clears throat> I think there are, very, uh, there are a lot of controversial points, but one should get into controversy once one had agreed on the basis. That's absolutely crucial. So what we try to do is exactly that, provide a carpet for debate. It's always important if you talk any kind of energy issues to look at the entire movie over a long period of time. If you look at a pho photograph, it doesn't tell you anything because it changes so, it can change so dramatically from one to the other year that you have to assess developments over long periods of time. What we have here is reactor startups in the world uh, in green and in red reactor shutdowns. Uh, so you can, you can see if you <clears throat> only look at the, the last part of the story, you miss actually the most significant parts of the history when there were large waves of reactor startups in the 1970s and then the 1980s. But from the end of the 1980s onwards, it's pretty flat. So the red and the green startup shutdown is basically uh, uh, very similar. So in cumulated terms, what does that provide us with? Uh, it's a situation where we have this uninterrupted rise uh, until the, the end of the 1980s, uh, with the first stop of that rise in 1989, and from then on really a flat situation, uh, until this event in 2011, in Japan, which of course had a dramatic impact on the numbers of operating nuclear power plants in the world. Now, we thought that, you know, when, when you look at international statistics of the International Atomic Energy Agency or any governmental statistics, they don't show that because the, the reactors in Japan are officially still in operation. Now, which is quite amazing because there's no reactor generating electricity since September 2013. So that's a year and a half without any uh, kind of uh, generation of nuclear electricity. And in 2013, only two reactors generated electricity. But the official statistics say 48 reactors in operation. We, th we think that's quite misleading. So. What we did is we created a new category that we call long-term outage. 
So the reactors that are not officially being abandoned or shut down, but that have not generated electricity for the entire year uh, before we release our report, and for the time within the, for the first half of the current year, we call them in long-term outage. So we take them out of the statistics of operating reactors. We think that is much closer to reality than the um, international official statistics. So if we look at the, the situation, the same image for the 28 countries of the European Union, you get a very similar development pattern uh, until the end of the 1980s. When I say development pattern, you look at these graphs in terms of shapes. You know, one, it's, it's important to understand what goes up, what goes down, what is big, what is small, much more than a, a, a figure. Figures you can debate. Is it, is it uh, 177 or was it 178? It doesn't make a difference to understand trends. This is trend analysis. So we, we're trying to look at the big picture. Uh, and it's very clear here, the message. It's had the same development pattern un until the end of the 1980s. But from then on, it's pretty different, right? From then on, we have a decline, very clear decline. Uh, and today we have uh, 47 nuclear reactors less in operation than at the peak time at, at the end of the 1980s. Just keep that in mind when you read that there is one reactor under construction in France, one reactor under construction in Finland, and two reactors under construction more or less in Slovakia and Europe. It's irrelevant to this trend, entirely irrelevant. It doesn't change anything. You wouldn't even see those, those reactors when they come online because more reactors get actually closed than start up. So th that's, that's the idea. Look at the trends. Now, uh, we've seen that the, the numbers of reactors are operating. So they, when they operate, they generate electricity. There's 31 countries in the world that generate nuclear electricity. But this picture shows very clearly that we don't have a pattern where it's spread out over the 31 countries. Uh, on the contrary, it's very much concentrated uh, to a large, uh, to a, concentrated to a small number of countries. So roughly, for many years, it's been the, the top five that have been generating approximately two thirds of the nuclear electricity in the world. In fact, two countries, the US and France, generate approximately half of the nuclear electricity in the world. Or said differently, one country, France, generates about half of the elect nuclear electricity in the European Union. So those are the orders of magnitude to understand what the significance is. Now the other thing we did is we tried to understand how does the maximum generation of electricity develop over time. So we looked at the peak generation of electricity historically per country. So this is the lighter color here. So, and it's not really surprising that we find Japan, that was actually a big player a few years ago, move back, uh, you know, uh, practically to, to uh, de facto to zero uh, gener nuclear generation. This is still for 2013, so there was a little bit of nuclear generation yet. Uh, the other country that uh, is remarkable, particularly remarkable, is Germany, was also a big player until uh, um, 311, when it decided to phase out nuclear power entirely by 2022, uh, and had uh, shut down immediately eight of 17 uh, reactors. But you can also see that you know a number of other countries have actually the lighter part is higher than the red or blue part. So the historical generation was actually higher than what they have done in 2013 or 2012. That was number of reactors, generation of nuclear electricity. Um, and um, so we look here at the absolute uh, generation of electricity, which you can see actually continued to rise until 2006. And then it declined. And obviously, we see the, the, the Fukushima effect from 2011 onwards. But the most remarkable part here is actually the relative share of nuclear power in the world's commercial electricity generation. And when you look at that, you realize that the peak was actually 
achieved already 20 years ago uh, in, uh, in the middle of the 1990s. And from then on, we see you know, a steady, slow, but steady decline. That decline had only been accelerated at the end of this graph after the, after the events in, in Japan. So th that is a first important lesson here. We, uh, Fukushima did not trigger any crisis in the, um, in the nuclear industry. It accelerated a pre-existing decline. In very much to the contrary to what you can usually read in the papers or, or see on television. Now, if you try to understand where, where this, this travel is going, um, one of the criteria to look at is obviously the number of reactors um, under construction. Um, so this is the historical, you know, over the entire history of uh, nuclear constructions, the number of units that were at some point listed as under construction. And, you know, the industry loves to show a graph from 2005 to 2015. That's very neat, you know, because you, indeed, we, Jesus, we have like doubling the number of reactors under construction. So that's a very, you know, significant increase, which is true. It's not negligible. But what does, that does not tell is that in 2005, the number of reactors under construction was so low that you have to go back to the beginning of the nuclear age to find an, an equivalent low number of units under construction. Far from sufficient to actually provide the turnover to you know, bring online as many reactors uh, that are being closed down. And we see that even over the past years, we, we, again, we see a decline in, in numbers. So that trend doesn't seem to you know, be prolonged uh, uh, much. Who are the players? Well, it's quite simple. There's actually only one, and there's China. Uh, China has 38% um, uh, of the 23 of a total of 61 reactors under construction. So it's, it's a, this is the only big player. The other countries like Russia with eight, India with six, US with five, South Korea with th uh, four, all the other countries only have one, one site like either one or two reactors under construction. Uh, the other thing which is really interesting is if, if you look at this, uh, this um, column here, which gives you the construction start, because you find some interesting dates here. 1983, that's quite a while ago huh, to have started. But the absolute record holder is in the United States. Watts Bar 2 started construction in 1972. They had planned to finish it in, in 2012, which would have been nice, you know? It's like 40-year project, <laughs> round figure, you know? But it didn't exactly work out, and it's, um, you know, I don't know. Now they say maybe this year, maybe not, uh, so um, speculations are open. But there's also other countries, you know, like uh, I was mentioning Slovakia earlier, you know? It's 30 years in the statistics as under construction. Uh, Ukraine, 1986-87. Um, so we see that, that many of these projects, in fact, there's eight that have been listed there for over 20 years. Um, <clears throat> and we did a, a very detailed assessment, and we, we realized that uh, there, there are now at least, those are substantiated, at least 49 of these are delayed. And when I'm saying delayed, it can be anything from several months to many years. Um, so it's, it's a global phenomenon. Now the other thing I wanted to attract your attention on this slide is that you see the, the lighter colors here are actually units that had been in the statistics at some point but were abandoned. In nuclear history, it's over 250 reactor orders that have been canceled. So a unit that is listed as under construction, there's no guarantee whatsoever that this will actually be uh, finished. Uh, and generate electricity at some point. Keep that in mind. Now, in the absence of large uh, uh, new build programs, it is clear that the, the average age of the current fleet increases constantly. We can basically always add a year 
You know, we don't even have to, to calculate it, it. When we calculate it a year later, it's a, the fleet is a year older, right? I mean, it's pretty amazing. So currently it stands uh, um, at about 29 years. That's the, the average age of the, the reactors operating. I don't know, there's people here that, that weren't even born then, but uh, if you remember the car th that you've been driving 30 years ago, that was another technological age. Right? I mean, it's a very different technology uh, today. So these are old machines, very old machines. So half, almost half of the reactor fleet is now operating for 30 years and more. This is particularly problematic because the, the market situation of nuclear power is getting in increasingly um, complicated. Can you just give me a Um, so, and this is really something, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but it's something I'm very much concerned about. Because what we see today is that, that the economic situation of the operating utilities is, is in terrible state. Uh, so <clears throat> one of the reasons, or one of the few blips I wanted to give you here is a, a few case studies, uh, where the market prices so the, 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 the bulk rate for electricity barely or not is not covering anymore the, the costs. In Belgium, uh, uh, GDF Suez uh, filed a court case against the government and lost the case. Um, they they <clears throat> were fighting a fuel tax, which they said could drive them over the edge of profitability if they have to pay it. They lost it. So. Uh, they, they made a statement where they said, now um, we are keeping all uh, options open, which means shutting down reactors much earlier than anticipated because they're not profitable anymore. In Sweden, we have seen data that illustrates that at least three reactors were not making any money, were losing money, two out of four years. Uh, and with the new government announcing a 17% a tax increase can have a similar effect as in, in Belgium. Um, in, in Germany, you know, Germany, as I mentioned before, has a nuclear phase-out program, so a, a by and by shutting down of the remaining nine reactors. Uh, the uh, utility E.ON decided to shut down one reactor seven months earlier than required by law. Why? Because it's not making any money. It's impossible to actually um, uh, make a profit with that machine. And finally, in the U.S., as you, as you probably know, they, there were five shutdown decisions. After, after a situation where I think for 15 years there was no movement, uh, no, no reactor startups, no shutdowns, the utilities announced in one year five shutdowns for very similar reasons, including two reactors that were actually licensed to operate beyond 2030. So that means that the, the traditional utilities, not only nuclear ones, but in particular nuclear ones, are under increasing pressure. And it's, it's, the situation is so bad that, to illustrate that, the 20 largest uh, uh, energy utilities in, in the European Union lost about half of their stock value since 2008. Now that's half a trillion euros half 500 billion euros it's a huge amount of money uh, that is uh, that is lost in capital value um, so th there is a real uh, situation of crisis uh, one example because it's the largest nuclear uh, country in terms of percentage generated from nuclear power in the electricity mix but also because uh, EDF EDF, Electricité de France, is the largest nuclear operator in the world with 58 nuclear reactors. And Arriva uh, is the largest or one of the largest nuclear builders uh, in the world and integrated nuclear companies doing basically everything from uranium mining and I'm sure many of you are aware that Arriva is very active in this country uh, to um, uh, waste management. So they do the in entire, entire chain, uh, fuel chain. So both companies are 85% uh, or 87% for Arriva owned by the government. 
So people always thought, well, what can happen to a government-owned company, right? I mean, uh, not much. Well, not exactly. The problem is that the operating costs uh, in France increased in, in dramatic ways over the past few years. Um, the regulator, the energy regulator in France has calculated that uh, the loss in one year in 2012 was about 1.5 billion because the income from tariff sales, from kilowatt hour sales, did not cover the costs anymore, which, which incidentally is illegal in France. So there's no other choice but to increase rates or to reduce costs. Reduce costs is not to do because, uh, on the contrary, old reactors, lack of investment over the past few years, so costs are increasing. So there's no other choice but to increase tariffs. Uh, the, the stock value, and we'll come back to that, plunged significantly um, over the past few years, and the debt load of this company is now 34 billion euros. I mean, 34 billion euros is really a very large uh, number. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, this is about, uh, there, there were, were months-long discussions with the European Union and uh, the French government to authorize a deficit, a budget, state budget deficit beyond 3%. 3% is the, is the legal, European legal limit. And France didn't make it. And they, they requested um, an, uh, the authorization uh, to, to go to, four, um, to, go to um, 4%. That difference between 3 and 4%, I calculated, is about 11 billion euros. 11 billion euros for the state uh, deficit. So we are talking here for the debt of this utility three times that amount. So people that think, well, you know, the government is just going to bail out uh, EDF or bail out Arriva, it's not going to work like that. There is no money to bail out. Um, Arriva's situation is even worse. Arriva is, uh, is technically bankrupt. There's absolutely no doubt. This company lost eight billion uh, in, in four years, uh, with uh, a capital of th something like three and a half billion and a debt load of over five, 5.8 5 uh, billion uh, euros. So this, this company is de facto bankrupt, right? And it was downgraded to junk by Standard & Poor's uh, in November last year and downgraded again since. So here we see the, the stock price development of EDF, largest nuclear uh, operator in the world. While the, this is a national indicator, you always have to put it against an indicator because an economic crisis leads to all companies going downhill and it doesn't tell you anything. So a good indicator is like the NASDAQ or other, other national indicators. If you do that for France, this is what gives the difference between the state-owned company and the, the 40 largest companies uh, in France. You look at the Arriva case, this is what it gives. So it's dramatic, absolutely dramatic in terms of uh, loss of value. Now, just a few words <clears throat> on, um, we, we always have a sort of a 10-page section, 15-page section in the report on the comparison between nuclear and renewable energy developments. So what we did here is we, we have in blue uh, wind energy um, capacity, generating capacity development. In green, it's, it's uh, solar pho photovoltaics, and in, uh, in red, it's nuclear. And this is since uh, the year 2000. So the changes, the capacity change since 2000. So we have a less than in year 2000 for nuclear, and we have a huge increase in wind and solar. Obviously, the capacity doesn't tell you the whole story. You have to look at the generation of electricity. But even in electricity terms, and here we looked at starting 1997. You remember, 97 was the signing of the Kyoto Protocol. So we wanted to know what, since the Kyoto Protocol actually was generated in addition by nuclear, wind, or solar. And the result is really staggering <clears throat> because you see that, that um, um, the, the, the electricity generated, added since 97 by wind is about five times as much as nuclear. And even photovoltaics just caught up with, with nuclear, which is quite a an impressive uh, uh, result. Uh, China um, is 
the, the most amazing uh, uh, country in terms of renewables development because the thing is China doesn't only do nuclear, they, um, they do a lot more renewables than they do nuclear. Uh, they invested already five times more in 2010 in renewables than in, in nuclear. So the result is here. In, um, in uh, the, the cap capacity addition by photovoltaics paced out in 2013 uh, uh, nuclear additions. And here's production. So wind alone generates more power in China now since 2012 than, than nuclear, in spite of that large building program. Because of the time factor, it's just much faster to implement. So um, to conclude this, I mean, you can read this, but uh, they, the, you can read faster than I can read, uh, tell you this. But uh, the basic message is, we have a situation where the global nuclear industry has been in crisis and in a decline trend for many years. This is, has nothing to do with Fukushima. It's um, merely an acceleration of a pre-existing trend. The second thing is that uh, it's important to understand, and I'm very concerned, that the economic and financial situation of the uh, operating companies is so bad and so problematic that this will have an effect on safety. Can you imagine a company that is technically bankrupt, like Arriva, is operating the planet's most dangerous place, which is La Hague, the La Hague reprocessing facility uh, in, in, in Normandy in France, which has the largest radioactive inventory. Uh, the, the spent fuel that is stored there is equivalent to over 100 reactor cores. Uh, with, without any, any kind of uh, protection. It's like basically steel roofs, um, you know, no, no major protection. Um, that company has 50 tons of plutonium on the site. So a company that has announced that they want to get rid of 500 people on that site because of economic pressure, 500 people? What did they do until now? Fishing or, you know? I mean, how, how is it possible that you can get rid of 500 jobs on a site like that, of maybe 3,000. So I'm very concerned, and the same is true, of course, for the utility EDF, but it's also true for in other countries. The utilities are under enormous pressure, and that will have consequences on safety. On the other hand, uh, and, and that's my final point, uh, it's, it's very clear that we're in the middle of an energy revolution. Uh, not at the beginning, we're right in the middle. We just didn't get it yet. Uh, because uh, the, the economic feasibility today of renewables is such that they're fully competitive, competitive with other sources in many regions and countries in the world already. But it will be a, a game changer over the, within the next five years in most of the, of the countries on the planet. So what I think is that uh, we have to be very careful, we're very aware of the pressures that exist on one hand, and on the other hand, on the opportunities that, opportunities that come up on the other hand. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Please, uh, all your questions, there will be a period for questions, hopefully, after that. Uh, now, Arne Gunderson is going to talk to you. Bonjour. Um, good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm Arnie Gunderson with, uh, with the Fairwinds team, uh, and we're all here today. Good morning. I'm Arnie Gunderson with the Fairwinds team, and we're all here today. Um, uh, I have to mention that we're really a, a crew, and every crew has the, uh, the person that's uh, telling us how to row and, and when to stroke. And, and that person's not me. I'm just a talking head here. I, I, uh, the, the, the strategy behind, uh, behind Fairwinds is, is my wife, Maggie, and she's over there. Uh, so. <clears throat> As Michael said, we've got, we've got China. That, that decision is not being made by the Chinese. It's being forced down on them by, uh, by a group of, of bureaucrats. Um, I studied uh, in Jordan. Um, the, the king of Jordan made a decision, we're going to have nuclear. 
And despite the fact that a significant fraction of the population wanted uh, no nukes, um, the, the Jordanians wound up buying Russian nuclear reactors. So all of these countries are where the bureaucrats at the top are forcing nuclear power down on the, um, <clears throat> on the population. Well, I think that, uh, and it's not just China, it's also uh, a, a, a country within my country called South Carolina and Georgia. Um, and you know, Michael showed the five nuclear plants that are being built in, uh, in the states. Well, those five uh, nuclear plants are being built where the ratepayers are subsidizing the risk and the companies are making the profit. So uh, in all of these situations, we've distorted basic capitalism and, um, and people are accepting the risk while others are making the, uh, the profit. Um, you know, it, it really boils down to, on the cleanliness issue, um, it, it's an environmental justice issue. And I, we haven't used that word a lot here, but I've heard it a couple times. Um, I, I had a chance to, um, to, to um, set up a study at Savannah River. And I thought the locals would love to know what's really happening in the mud in the Savannah River. Savannah River is between Georgia and South Carolina, and it's a a nuclear waste dump that dates back to the bomb age. And I thought the locals would love to hear that. And I was told, no, you don't want the locals to even know you're doing it because they want the jobs. And, th and the same thing happens, at, I was at Sellafield last month and um, we wanted to take dust samples inside people's homes. And the, um, the, the, we were told they're not gonna help you because they want the jobs. But after the, the, the money stops flowing long before the risks end. And I, I think that's an important piece here. Okay, um, uh, the last piece on, on waste and nuclear cleanliness, uh, I'd like you to think about the person who built a nuclear power plant is going to convince you that don't worry, we are smart enough to store that waste for a quarter of a million years. But you are so dumb, you can't store electricity from the sun overnight. That's really the, I, that's, a, that's a hard argument to win <laughs> when, you're, when you're in the nuclear industry. Okay, safety. Um, the um, uh, policymakers are looking at the risk of nuclear as a one in a million event. But we know that we've had five meltdowns in 35 years. We've had TMI, partial meltdown, Chernobyl, complete meltdown, and three meltdowns at Fukushima. Well, 35 divided by five is the odds of a, of a nuclear meltdown somewhere on the planet are about once every seven years. Policymakers would not be making the decision to build nuclear if they viewed risk based on the real world statistics. But in fact, they've been influenced by, um, by the companies that build nuclear and the regulators. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is probably at the top of this heap. And they crank out numbers convincing policymakers that the chance is about one in a million of a nuclear reactor accident per reactor year. With 400 reactors, like Michael said, a million divided by 400 means a nuclear accident about once every 2,500 years. And yet we've had five in the last 35 years. So where are our policymakers um, getting that number from? Uh, when you look at the real world data, it doesn't support the decision that this is a risk-free proposition. I spoke at Pickering uh, two years ago, and um, I was at the second day, and a bunch of uh, locals said, you know, we, we love these people, they pay their taxes, we love these people, they, uh, they go to our church, we love these people, They're our, um, they play on our soccer teams, their kids are great, and um, if it weren't safe, they wouldn't work there. And, I, and I, I say to myself, well, what does that mean about Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and, and Fukushima? Did those workers come in every day on a, on a jet plane from, from a, a thousand kilometers away? Did they know it was unsafe? And this is a technology that can turn on you overnight, that it can, regardless of the ethic of the individuals in that power plant, it can have a meltdown tomorrow. And I think that's something that decision makers have pushed out of their mind, thinking it's not gonna happen at my power plant. Um, in America, we have this mythical place called Lake Wobegon. Um, 
It, it doesn't exist on the map, but it's a place where all the women are strong, all the men are handsome, and all the children are smarter than average. Think about that. And wh wherever I go around the world, I hear people saying, well, my nuclear plant, these people are better than average. I've never gone to a site where the people in the town said, oh, no, mine, mine's worse than average. The, so the people in the towns are, are firmly convinced that because these people are nice, because they are safety conscious, that their nuke is not going to have an accident. But history shows we've had five meltdowns in 35 years with nice people, brilliant people, safety conscious people at the controls. Um, I have a saying, uh, sooner or later, I think nuclear fits this really well, sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. And that's, and that's nuclear. Uh, so that's clean, no. Safe, no. Reliable. Um, Dr. Mark Cooper and, and Michael have clearly shown that nuclear power plants um, uh, are really not as reliable as policymakers would have you believe. When they make decisions going forward, they believe that a nuclear power plant will run about 93% of the, of the year. But that number is a, has been fudged because every time a nuclear power plant fails, they take it out of the database. So it's sort of like saying the average American is 100 because if you don't get to 100, we'll take you out of the database. In fact, when you look at all of the nuclear plants that have failed in the United States, the actual reliability of a nuclear plant is less than 80% according to Dr. Mark Cooper. And policymakers believe, one, nuclear plants will run for 60 years, when in fact the oldest nuclear plant is about 48 years right now, and, uh, and that they'll run at 92%. So, and of course, Japan lost 35% of its capacity, 54 nuclear plants, and still continue to function as a, as a society. Yes, there were, there were uh, you know, hardships, but they got through without nuclear, so it can be done. This is a technology that is really not reliable. And you know, I've met with Naoto Khan, I've read Gorbachev's memoirs, we all know about uh, Merkel, um, and, and three other prime ministers in Japan have all said, this is a technology that can destroy the fabric of a country overnight. So it's not clean, it's not safe, and it's really not reliable. Then why then, are policymakers continuing to pursue this, this nuclear road? And I would submit to you that it's because they can't envision a different future. They're trapped in a 20th century paradigm of central station power. And the 21st century does not have to be like the 20th century. It can be different, and in fact, you know, Michael's numbers show it will be different. We will have a distributed grid with small generators and battery storage that will be cheaper than nuclear power. So I submit to you at the end of this conference, we should probably say, yes, I'm against mining and I'm against uh, waste abandonment and um, uh, I'd love to sh sh shut nuclear power plants down. But if that's what we're saying, policymakers' eyes will glaze over and they'll say, well, what are you going to do without it? So we all need to take the opposite uh, approach here and, and talk about a future that can be nuclear free and be inexpensive as well. The actual cost of solar voltaic plus storage, uh, Elon Musk, the guy who uh, built Tesla, uh, is now, um, he now believes that, uh, and SpaceX and a whole bunch of other things, smart guy, um, is now getting battery storage down to about two cents. And solar is about six or eight cents. So we can have solar electric with batteries. So that takes away the base load argument for something in the order of six to 10 cents. And a new nuclear power plant is 15. So the future doesn't have to be like the past. We can have in the 21st century, um, a small distributed power, just like we've done with our cell phones and just like we've done my God, this computer here has more power than the one I did my thesis on. Um, and uh, so the, 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 the concept of a distributed network that costs less than the central station paradigm that we had in the 20th century is, the, is what we have to leave our policymakers with. 
They have to understand that there's an alternative. And I think given an alternative, they'll jump at it. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, five minutes before break for questions, so please come on and uh, speak at the microphone, please. And just identify yourself b before asking your question. can be addressed to the panelists. Yeah. Okay. You go. Excellent, excellent presentations. Thank you. I'm Angela Bischoff from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. I would like to place your presentation, Michael, in a Canadian context and mention that Ontario, so Quebec or France you mentioned was the most nuclearized jurisdiction getting something like 75% of their electricity from nuclear power. Ontario is the second most nuclearized jurisdiction in the world getting 60% of its electricity from nuclear power. We have 18 working reactors and they're all old and they all are about to be shut down in the next decade or rebuilt. We've cancelled any prospects for building new station, new reactors, but we're about to move forward with rebuilding 10 reactors in Ontario at a time when we know that there are so many lower cost options, including water power from Quebec, wind, solar, all the other suite of options. So, and we know that we don't have the finance, there's no economic rationale for rebuilding these 10, these ten nuclear reactors. Uh, so why would, I mean, Michael or Arnie, would you like to step in and, I mean, we're doing our best to build opposition to re rebuilding these reactors, but there's no public discourse aside from the activist community jumping up and attending you know, conferences and sticking leaflets in people's faces. There's no media discourse about it. There's no just public awareness, let alone discussion. Can you weigh in on why the government, aside from jobs or, you know, the status quo, there must be something more going on. So, okay, a brief uh, comment on that. You, you have to step up. Well, it's kind of funny if somebody from Ontario wants me to interpret uh, Ontario decision making, but uh, as living in France. But I, so so make it, let me make it in a more general terms. Why is this actually ongoing? Because you can make the same argument for other countries in other situations. I think there is really uh, a very uh, profound sort of um, um, thinking that is based on yesterday's logic of. Uh, top-down, vertically integrated uh, energy, uh, energy making in general. And all these companies have been set up to deal with uh, kilowatt hour generation in a logic where it's centralized generation, transport over long distances, and distribution. And these companies, the big problem is that these companies are not set up for doing something else. They have only learned selling kilowatt hours. This is why I think that some of these companies are actually risking to go bankrupt. Because they, they, they are not player, big players in, in tomorrow's systems. But we know already where the system is going. So uh, they kind of try to save from the old system what they can. That's one of the reasons why in a country like the UK or even Germany you get huge lobby for off wind, uh, offshore wind because that's the old style, it's actually the old style system, it's just that it's wind instead of coal, gas or, or nuclear. It's centralized, you have to ship it over long distances, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's very, very much an, the, an old ment mental thing, but it's also a setup. They haven't learned to do something else. Thank you, we'll go on the front mic and then the two person on the back uh, microphone. 
can you make your comments brief and ask yes. a question, if possible? Thank Andy, you. Andy Neidecker from Switzerland. The term nuclear renaissance uh, is uh, pretty clear that it's uh, a, a fake. Can you, uh, both of you, or one of you, uh, say a few statements on the publicity efforts the industry is doing? That was not touched in your talks, and I think it's important that you understand that the, a term like nuclear renaissance has is, is excellent to promote something which is not taking place, and I think the publicity part needs to be addressed in this today's uh, talk. Maybe Arnie on this one? Yeah. I, I think the, um, the, the one argument that the industry seems to be hammering home in Washington and around the world is we can solve global warming um, and we're the only big player who can who can do that. Uh, in fact, you know, electricity, nuclear electricity is only, what did you say, 11% of the total? 11% yes. uh, of the total electricity. But electricity is only a small fraction of our total energy production. Uh, so the, the, the real uh, contribution of nuclear toward all of the global warming sources are about 3 or 4%. Uh, and so a very small piece of the pie, smaller than one to two percent, okay. So uh, let's say two percent of the final energy is coming from nuclear. So to count on nuclear to solve global warming is, uh, is absolutely wrong. And I guess that I get back to that one liner by, uh, by, by Peter Bradford. You know, trying to solve global warming by building nuclear power plants is like trying to solve global hunger by serving caviar. If you, if you need something to throw back at them, it's, it's, that money would be better spent. There's an opportunity cost, is the term in economics, where the money would be better spent on something that comes online quicker and cheaper. You could reduce carbon faster and at less of a cost if you chose another alternative. Do you want to answer? Yeah. I'll wait here. Well, I, I, think, I think it's very clear that there have been hundreds of millions of dollars spent on propaganda by the nuclear industry over the past 15 years. This was an orchestrated uh, campaign to uh, put out the term uh, renaissance. And one, this is the additional comment. Because obviously a lot of people wonder why people still believe in nuclear new build, right? I mean, on a massive scale. Well, one answer is modern propaganda works. Thank you. Uh, now, the two questions, and we'll stop after those two questions uh, or comments in the back. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. I'm Barbara Burkett from Ontario. Um, I wonder if there are guidelines to help prevent the serious backlash against wind energy that, that is being experienced in some areas of Ontario because the... the um, windmills or whatever they're called, are, are placed too close to people and they, they're complaining of serious health side effects. And uh, is there a way to, pre to prevent that type of backlash? The, the, the uh, discussion, we have a cabin close to Algonquin Park and in that area, uh, wind companies, uh, we're very active trying to promote um, uh, windmills there. The problem is if, if wind power is done on the right scale, uh, right size for the, for the purpose, for the needs of the people locally, you build small windmills right, that, are on the, on the, that, that, are, that suit the purpose. So the right sizing is an absolute key issue. Another uh, approach is you know, which has become extremely popular in countries like Germany, is community power. So you, you have co-ops that invest into uh, uh, renewable energy or efficiency or combined heat and power. So you get other players in that actually do uh, uh, these projects on, a, on the right scale. And then you get the, the debate off the technology debate, because I think it's really insane to run campaigns against wind power it's, um, you know, the, the problem is that it's done in the right way, you know, and it's done in the right size. One other piece of, 
Okay, yeah. I have just one other piece of that is the issue of bird kills on, on windmills. Um, the, um, uh, the, the nuclear industry will say, well, look at all the birds you're killing. In fact, nuclear power kills more birds than does windmills. And the reason is that the migratory birds land on these mill tailing sites where the, where the acidic water kills them. And when you take into account the whole nuclear fuel cycle, uh, the front end, predominantly in the American West and America, um, is killing an enormous amount of birds because they land into that water and then die, not from the radiation, but from the acidity that's, that remains in the water. The back microphone, it's so interesting, but I think we'll have to, to stop after that. I'm sorry, uh, sorry. Oh. Okay, so back microphone, a comment or question, and then the two panelists will, will conclude. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as I walked in and uh, heard these wonderful speeches, I came to realize that uh, all we are really worried about is the economics of nuclear power. Uh, there is obviously more to it than that. Uh, the <coughs> plutonium we get has a direct link to our security as a planet in terms of nuclear war. And uh, the nuclear waste, I didn't see much talk or any statistics from Miles on nuclear waste, but the nuclear waste we have generated and it is abandoned, as uh, it is said. Uh, well, it is a challenge to future generations. Uh, taking this limited t view of the time and the uh, economics uh, is really uh, falling in a trap uh, that I think the planet is already in. We are in it. But we should not ever see economics argument as ruling the uh, 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 day, so to say. I mean, it's um, bad enough that we are trying to feed Cavalier to solve the hunger, but I think we are also feeding nuclear waste to solve hunger problem. And I think uh, I, I find the security angles completely missed. And in that sense, I'm disappointed. Thank you. Okay, uh, Michael Schneider will say a few words on that and we'll close the session after. A couple of points. Um, first of all, um, indeed, I'm, I have not been talking about the typical issues that everybody talks about, waste, proliferation, uh, and safety, uh, because there's a lot of people that talk about this. My rationale is very simple, is to say, uh, if this industry is going downhill, if it's not providing any answer to any of the questions uh, that are raised by uh, energy issues, uh, if it is more expensive than anything else, if it's not there in time, leave alone uh, uh, all the other issues, it will not be there in time. The time factor is absolutely crucial. Uh, not even, why should you take any risk can you explain to me why do I have to take, uh, you know, discuss even risks if the whole thing doesn't make any sense? You know, that's the, the argument I'm trying to make, is to say, it's not, I'm not contesting there, there are all these issues, but why should you take even a little bit of risk if it doesn't make any sense and doesn't provide any answers to the problems that this world is actually facing, which will be the, the issue of my workshop after, because what we really need is energy services. We need to supply heat and, and, and cooked food to people and lighting and not kilowatt hours, right? And this, this industry doesn't, doesn't address this issue at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. We have to close this session. Uh, thank you for your presence. It's a very lively and interesting session. Remember, uh, you will have more times in, in the workshops. I will just leave one minute for the organizers of uh, this conference. And uh, thanks, everybody.